Hello, my name is Eileen Glover. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company named Koala. Koala is all about the mass adoption of cryptocurrency. We want to make cryptocurrency useful, uh, accessible, and even fun for regular people to use. We're starting out on this process by creating a stable coin. A stable coin is a cryptocurrency that is designed to track uh, a fiat currency like the US dollar. That is, it's designed to hold a stable value. Uh, our team of 10 full-time developers from the fintech and blockchain space has been working quite some time to bring you this stable cryptocurrency in the very near future, and we're excited to have you uh, come and take part in this with us. Uh, please check out our Telegram channel at koala.tech. Thank you. Over the past few years, cryptocurrencies have become widely popular for their unmatched security and decentralization. While these currencies offer great advantages over old-fashioned government fiat money, they are all extremely volatile. This unpredictable variation in value makes them unsuitable for normal currency functions, like spending and saving. But what if there were a cryptocurrency that was designed to remain stable no matter the number of users, transactions, or external market influences? Well, now there is. Introducing KUSD, the world's first autonomously stabilized cryptocurrency with one of the fastest, most efficient blockchains ever. As a digital, decentralized alternative to fiat money, this next generation cryptocurrency will change the way we exchange value. Using the Koala protocol, KUSD takes advantage of advanced stability algorithms designed to ensure KUSD stays pegged to the value of the US dollar. When market demand increases, the KUSD blockchain creates more currency to meet the supply needed. And as the market demand decreases, the KUSD blockchain eliminates currency to lower supply. All of this is designed to happen automatically and transparently in real time to ensure the security, stability, and value of the currency. This means, for the first time ever, you can power your life or business on a stable cryptocurrency. This is the future of money. So, you go to the Oh, this is the slides. Yeah. Great. Um, hello, thank you for coming out. And I want to thank uh, also Smart Contract and Ethereum Japan for putting this on and having me tonight. My name is Ivan Glover. I'm the co founder and CEO of Koala. And Koala <coughs> is a company that's been working for quite some time now to develop a stable cryptocurrency. And the word cryptocurrency is really important in that phrase because the cryptocurrency, as we all know, especially those of us who love Ethereum, is not backed by any assets, right? It's mathematics and then market forces. And we believe that's very important because it allows you to have a decentralized currency and all of the things that come along with decentralization. There are asset backed currencies out there like Tether or TrueUSD and so on that are more centralized. And so I want to just point out early on that there's a big distinction I'm going to talk about tonight uh, between those two approaches to stable cryptocurrency. So what is Qual all about? We, what we care about and what we, the reason that we founded our company was to affect the mass adoption of cryptocurrency. Um, we looked around and my co-founder and I asked ourselves a really important question. We were, we loved Bitcoin, uh, we were excited about uh, Ether coming out, and we asked ourselves, hey, why if this is so amazing, this technology is so incredible and world changing, why does nobody use it? None of our friends, none of our family members, no, and still no one uses it. If we go down the street, there are very few people who actually own and use cryptocurrency. Why? We thought if we could answer that question and find the obstacles to adoption and start to fix those, then we could allow for mass adoption. So that's what we've been up to. Um, you probably heard about stable coins lately. It's starting to now become a big topic. In the last couple of months here, we've had two major investments in other projects. Uh, one is this investment, and Google is one of the investors. The latest investment came from a group called Lightspeed, and a, and a project called Basis, which is based in New York. 
or now in New Jersey, I think. Uh, another one is that Goldman Sachs and Bitmain came in with $110 million to back a new asset-backed cryptocurrency that is in the circle of Loniex ecosystem. So why are these huge brands, global brands, putting so much money into stablecoin? The reason is because stablecoin is a, a key an absolute key that can unlock a much, much bigger marketplace for cryptocurrency. And these institutions are interested in end users and financial services customers, right? So how are we going to get all of those people into the space? We have to have a stable cryptocurrency that doesn't have the volatility that undermines people's budgets and <coughs> businesses' business models. So, we actually have taken a backwards way to, uh, you know, we're kind of countercultural when it comes to uh, the cryptocurrency and blockchain space. We've been building our technology pretty quietly for over 18 months now, and we've been a company for a little bit over two years. We did that by raising just a little bit along the way as we hit certain milestones, and now we're getting ready to do a bigger raise, and this is what we think it's going to look like. Um, of $30 million and selling 148 million tokens. Uh, that's about 14%. The implied valuation on that is gonna be around 108 million for the total, for the total uh, uh, network. And we're gonna have this discount model. So one of the reasons that I came to Japan is I've been having meetings all week uh, with different people and potential partners and corporations and so forth because we've been looking for partners in different marketplaces. So I just wanna put that in your minds at the beginning just in case you have some uh, leads or ideas for us after this meeting. Um, secondly, we have a small allotment of our pre-sale tokens left over for individual investors that are either around and interested. Let's get into the actual uh, detail. So I mentioned already that we're really all about mass adoption, right? And we uh, think that you should make crypto stable, safe, easy to use, and actually fun for regular people if we want to get them into the space, right? We have to make it very, very simple, not scary, not intimidating, and and fun to get our friends and family to start using this stuff. Um, our cryptocurrency is designed for use and not just for trading, right? The trading marketplace is probably where a lot of people are very active, and the reason is that's the only place to really do anything in, in crypto right now, right? That's really kind of the only industry, ICOs and, and trading. We're going to see a lot of the projects that we've all been working on start to come to fruition and hit the marketplace and hopefully have a lot of real customers and real people using these services on the blockchain. But now it's still traders. So the traders are really important and stablecoin is very, very important as a trading pair for Bitcoin and Ether and Litecoin and so on. But our eyes are on this bigger prize, right? We're really ultimately aiming for mass adoption. So I mentioned to you a moment ago that when we started uh, Koala, my co-founder John Rotano and I had that big question for ourselves. Why not? Why is there no mass adoption? These are some of the areas that we identified. Volatility is, is definitely one of them, and stable coins are to address volatility. But that's not the only thing, right? We all know that um, even on our most beloved uh, blockchains, like Ethereum, the transactional throughput today is not so hot. It's still too slow. You know, you got uh, seven transactions per second on, on, on Bitcoin, a little bit better than that on the Ethereum network. But to have a true mass adopted payments platform that can compete with WeChat or Alipay, or Visa, and so on, you gotta have, you gotta be able to handle lots and lots of transactions. So, Additionally, distribution, right? So what does distribution mean? That means, is it easy to get cryptocurrency? Right now, it's still kind of hard. So we need to, we need to make it a lot easier for people to actually get their first cryptocurrency. Uh, the merchants don't accept cryptocurrency today for a couple of reasons. It's volatile, and there are no customers using it. So why would you, why would you really accept it, right? So there's, there's a barrier to merchant acceptance, and we need to bring them into the fold as well. And finally, in general, although there's some really cool uh, applications and wallets 
And some of the exchanges are getting a little bit better at making their interfaces and their processes consumer friendly. On the whole, when you compare you know, our user interfaces in the, in the cryptocurrency and blockchain space to something like Venmo or WeChat, they're not as good, right? So we need to make those a lot better. Um, this is just a visual representation of the volatility of Bitcoin and Ether relative to typical fiat to fiat trading pairs. So we all know this, we experience it, you know, I mean, uh, I feel like I have a heart attack every two weeks when the uh, price of Ether, you know, <laughs> makes, a, makes a, a wild jerk in one direction or the other. I'm either overjoyed or depressed. Um, <laughs> So, you know, we deal with that, it's hard, but regular consumers and people like, you know, your aunt or something, she's not gonna, she's not going to really, you know, use a super volatile cryptocurrency as a payment means, you know? And most people don't really even want to speculate for this because it makes them sick to their stomachs. So, we've gotta get cryptocurrency more stable so that we can get the rest of these people in. Okay, oops. All right, so what exactly is a stable coin? A stable coin. Picking a fiat currency and having a stable cryptocurrency uh, that tracks that price is the right solution for right now. People already think in terms of these fiat currencies, so if we want to bring them over, it's nice if they have an experience that's very similar to what they're already doing. You know, I'm from the United States. I think of things in dollars. When I look at my bill at the restaurant in Tokyo, I have to convert it to dollars to even know what it says, right? Um, so we want to make it easy for these people to come in. Later on, however, we can use things like the, the protocol that we've developed to create a, a currency that is not based on a fiat currency. It might be based on a basket of consumer goods, uh, different commodities, and so on. So that. That is definitely a possibility. It's not difficult, but when it comes to making something that's easy for adoption, we think it makes sense to stick with a currency that tracks a, a common fiat currency. Um, I mentioned right at the beginning that we have two different types, two main categories of cryptocurrencies, I mean stable coins rather, asset backed and non asset backed. So I'll talk just a little bit more about what that means. So you can think of Tether, some of you might use Tether. Uh, the idea of Tether is that you send me some dollar bills, or somebody does, and then take those dollar bills and then stick them in a bank vault, going to have pure transparency, uh, reporting every day about, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but, but that's the idea, right? I'm going to stick these, I'm going to stick these dollars in the bank vault, and I'm going to issue you a token, and it's going to be worth a dollar. And then you go out and use that, and then later, if you need to get your dollar back, no problem, come back to you, I'll give you your dollar back, okay? So it's kind of like a casino chip type model in a way, uh, otherwise, you know, or an IOU. So that approach is definitely centralized, right? Because somebody has to watch all those dollar bills in the bank. It could be the bank, it could be, you know, some people who control the account. But as soon as you do that and you stick those dollars somewhere, they're all, they're subject to, you know, being stolen, uh, frozen by the banking system or by government. Um, so. We don't think that's the best way to go for, for many, many reasons. What about non-asset backed? Non-asset backed is, um, is, as I said earlier, just like Ether. It's mathematics, everybody knows what's going to happen, and then let the market do what it's going to do, right? So the trick, if you want to design a non-asset backed stable, stable coin, you've got to create a system of incentives that retains that decentralization, but also results in a coin that stays stable, right? And that seems really hard to do, and actually it is hard to do, but it's, it's pretty easy to understand, and I'm gonna to explain to you a little bit how we do it. Um, first, a little bit about our, our, our dev team. Um, we've added a new person today, actually, but I don't even know his name yet, I just heard about that through, from, uh, from my colleagues, I'm excited to add him to this uh, slide when we get that. Basically, these are uh, a hardcore team of uh, now 10 guys who come out of two types of backgrounds, uh, FinTech and also blockchain, and specifically uh, Ethereum-oriented projects. 
and I'll show you a little bit about what they've been creating. Um, so I mentioned a moment ago that you, you know, if you want to design a, a stable cryptocurrency that not, that's not asset-backed, you have to uh, create this system of incentives, right? Sometimes I think of it as like a, uh, you write a symphony of incentives, and then the marketplace has to play all of the parts. And then what has to come out the other end is this product, this cryptocurrency, that retains its value at the same level all the time. Uh, this is not really easy for you to read, I see. So what I'm going to do instead of going through this one, actually, now that I see this, I want to show you. I want to show you the system in action by showing you some agent-based modeling that we've done, and I'll explain uh, as it's going through its uh, its paces what's happening and how how this thing is maintaining its stability. So what agent-based modeling means is that you 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 program in, in our case, these stability mechanisms that I was talking about, and then you create a lot of little uh, robotic humans, right? Different traders in our case, and miners, who have different characteristics. Some of them are lazy, some of them are panicky, and so on. Some of them are super greedy. And then you let them have at it, they make their own decisions, and you run the test over and over and over, and you can check to see if your assumptions and your and your technology actually plays out in a simulated market environment. Uh, let's put this one right here. Yeah. Just a so what we're going to see here is a simulation of the launch of KUSD on the exchange. <coughs> this says $1 here. This says at 102. So that's two cents. This says 98 cents. So you're talking about a four cent band range. And what's happening is, uh, can we click on this tab here? Yeah. What's happening is that when this value goes above one US dollar, that's not cool, that's not okay. So the information comes into our blockchain via a decentralized oracle, and then the blockchain itself will begin to take action. What it does is it begins to increase the block reward. So every single block reward is variable depending on the price in the marketplace. So check this out. These are the mining rewards here. Notice that we dropped below on USD here, and this is what happened. The block reward dropped precipitously, and now it's to zero. We've been under a dollar slightly at 99.81 cents, and so the block reward is at zero. Can you can we make it so that we can see this part? Like, oh yeah. Um, okay, cool. Now, once this price has been below one US dollar for a little while longer, something else kicks in. And that's what you see down here. This is what we call the stability fee. The mining rewards or the block rewards are the way that the blockchain automatically adds money to the money supply. And the stability fee down here is how the blockchain removes money from the money supply. What this is, is a like a tiny tax on on-chain transactions that takes place. So imagine if you were going to, you know, send someone $100, 100 KUSD, and it happened to be at a moment when this was in effect. This stability fee here was a little bit under one basis point when it hit the when it hit the height here. So you would you would end up paying a fraction of a penny, right? So maybe it would, you know, you wouldn't be able to see it only to two decimal places. There is a maximum cap on where this can reach. So let's say that what if what if what if there was less demand and then a stable coin for a period of time and it was hanging out at 98 cents? This stability fee would kick in and stay in and it would max out at 2%. Now, what's happening to that money? This is really important. This stability fee, this transaction fee that occurs only when the price is below one US dollar. It's not go to us, it doesn't go to our miners, it doesn't go to the local government or something like that. Instead, it goes to a dead end address uh, or a burn wall, all right? So that money is being removed from the money supply in a way that is totally transparent that everybody can see. So it's an address from which it can never emerge. So this is a system that we call mint and burn when it needs to the blockchain will mint currency. When it needs to, it will burn currency. This is, we think, this is totally unique. There's not another project that does uh, stability in this way. 
And we think it's a major, major advantage for a few reasons. One is it's very, very simple to understand. It's transparent. It's easy to monitor. This is important because what's really holding this, what's really holding this close to one US dollar is not just the stability, not just these mechanisms, right? If we just depended on adding to the adding to the money supply and subtracting from the money supply, and that was it, then it would take a long time sometimes for the price to return back to one dollar. Right? It might be a little bit loose and slow. But what these this stability uh, mechanisms do, these algorithmic stability mechanisms do, is they create kind of a pure arbitrage opportunity for traders, for self-interested traders who want to make money. So for example, some of you may be traders. Let's say that we're here at this peak. It looks like the traders are doing something right here, right? So that hit, it looks like a dollar and one cent. And some number of people, of traders, are deciding to sell right now. And that makes a lot of sense if this is happening over and over all day long. Why? Because you might make one point on your money in three minutes. And then if it comes down here, you buy, and you might make another point on your money in the next two, three minutes, and so on. This is a certain type of game. If some of you do uh, uh, arbitrage trading, you might be familiar with this, or if you've been involved in, in commodities and futures trading, this is, a, this is the type of game they play, where you're doing high-speed trading, making relatively small percentages time and time again, which ends up being a really big number. So another way of saying the same thing is because the algorithms are predictable, everybody knows what they're going to do, right? You know exactly what's going to happen based on the price in the marketplace. So if you're a trader and you see that thing at a dollar and two cents, you are not wise if you don't sell right then. Why? Because you know new money supply is coming. The algorithms aren't going to add to the money supply. They are going to bring it back down. So traders then can front run the algorithms, and that's intentional, right? So we want to create a, a nice little profit center for traders with these algorithms because the traders bring very, very important things to the table. One is, as they start to compete with each other, one guy might say, I'm going to buy it as soon as it hits a dollar and one. I'm sorry, sell it when it hits a dollar and one. And the other guy might be saying, okay, I'm going to wait and see if it hits a dollar two. So the dollar one guy is going to get the sale, right? The dollar two guy, the guy's not going to get a chance. So the competition amongst these traders who are seeking a profit keeps the price from ever going very far from one US dollar. And this was something that kind of surprised me, actually, before we did this. Uh, when we were planning this and designing these algorithms, I had a concern. You know, I thought, wow, we're going to have to have like a 35% reserve or something because I don't know. I just don't think it's going to, you know, it's going to be too loosey goosey. And we threw all kinds of scenarios at this, at these stability mechanisms, and we can't get it to budge very far from one USD. And the reason is because of the traders. Okay, so that's uh, so that's a beautiful, wonderful thing. I think you know where you have where you can set up this this system that provides uh, incentives, people pursuing profit, and the byproduct is a cryptocurrency that holds its value. And that's how this thing works. What I was attempting to show you, we can go back to the presentation. What I was attempting to show you is the uh, current test map. So. We have there's a second there's a second sort of piece to the story of, of what we've been building, and that is a, a blockchain that is a fork of the Ethereum code base, but one that's really really fast. So what we did is we decided to um, to fork the Ethereum code base and take the Tendermint consensus protocol and modify it heavily for our purposes and marry it to our fork of the Ethereum code base. The reason we did this was um, because of that throughput issue that I was talking about a little while earlier, right? What we've achieved by doing that is, is pretty incredible, we think. 
It's a fully functioning fork of the Ethereum code base that can run Ethereum-based smart contracts right out of the box, but one that has one second block times and 7,000 transactions per second at this time. We think we have a pathway to get many, many more transactions per second as well. The other thing about this blockchain is that it's very, very inexpensive to run a node. So our best estimates right now are that you could spin up an instance on Amazon Web Services, for example, or another cloud-based system, and run a node for 40 bucks a month. So this is all, of course, one of the, one of the things that's amazing about proof of stake consensus protocols. That means that we have been able to change, change this, take this very, very inexpensive, but very, very fast mining, and turn it into something else. And this takes me to kind of a description of our token economics, okay? So in the KUSD blockchain, we have actually two different tokens. We have a stable coin, KUSD, but we also have something called a mining token. A mining token is something that we sell. That's a speculative asset. You need mining tokens in our network if you want to stake your node and mine KUSD. So, Another way of saying that is that the mining tokens in the KUSD blockchain are almost like a, when you own mining tokens, you really own a piece of the future market cap growth of the stable coin. Why? Because, because it's not asset backed, every time there's more demand in the marketplace for this stable coin, the price goes up slightly. The blockchain, which is essentially a robot that's going to control its own money supply, will begin to create new stable coins. Those newly created stable coins get distributed in those block rewards that I showed you, and those flow to our miners. So if you own mining tokens on the KOC blockchain, you're basically getting all the newly minted mining, uh, sorry, uh, stable coins that are ever produced. And then we count on the miners, some number of them, to turn around and sell those on the exchanges. That then re reduces the price in the exchange because it's increasing the money supply. But we don't require they can do what they like with those. So um, I see some quizzical looks, and I see some nodding heads. Uh, is that does that seem confusing really quickly? Should I go through that a little bit more? This token thing, the way the two, to two tokens work. Yes. Okay. All right. So. Um, Let's go back. Let's go back to, to yeah, that one. Yeah. So you still can't read this very well. Very well. Okay. So here we have um, different avenues, right? So think of this as as the uh, as the blockchain. It's getting the information from the decentralized oracle coming into the network, and if the if the price is above a dollar, there's a problem, right? We need more money in the money supply. So the blockchain is going to begin to produce that on its own. These algorithms, this, this stability algorithms will tell it to begin to produce more. You can think of like Uber dynamic pricing or something like that. You know, if, you, if, you, if you're trying to take an Uber downtown and there's a, there's a game or something, the price can go up slightly. Or you can even think of this, um, the air conditioning in this room. You turn, the, you turn the air conditioning up and there is a function that brings it up slowly, right? So if the price is reported as too high, what's going to happen is the minting is going to start to increase. Okay. That newly minted money flows into, in this situation, flows into the wallet of the miners. Okay. You cannot be a miner. You cannot even mine. You cannot mine, period, unless you have mining tokens. Right. So if you have mining tokens, it gives you the right to mine. And if you're mining, you can benefit from this newly minted money. All right, so what you want as a miner is a couple of things. You want people to really use this currency, all right? You want payment platforms to adopt it. You want companies to adopt it. Why? Because every time there's more demand, you're getting paid. <coughs> if it goes below $1, remember, the block rewards stop, and now that transaction fee is charged to on-chain transactions. And that's diverted to the burn wall, right? It's not removed from miners, but it's diverted to this to this burn wall. So the you can think of the mining token, I don't know, you can think of it like something like an apartment building. You know, if you own an apartment in Tokyo, you could, and you're not going to live there, you could rent it out 
and you're going to get rent every month. Plus, you own the asset, right? So hopefully the value of your apartment is going to increase as well. So you can sell the apartment, or you can hold it and take the rent, or you can hold it and not, and not even rent it out, you can keep it empty. That's the way a mining token is. If you own a mining token, you can just, you can just, you can not mine it. That's like owning the apartment building but not renting it out. I wouldn't advise that. You can mine it, and you're going to get an income in the form of the stable coin every time the market cap increases for that stable coin. And if you want to, you can sell it. You can sell the mining token on an exchange. So the mining token is this really cool, uh, it's a really cool thing because it's, it's a token that has a revenue stream in the form of stable coin. So for example, let's say that you uh, had mining tokens and you just wanted to, uh, you know, you're a trader. You want to mine stable coins and what you want to do with those is use them to go into the markets and trade for other, for other cryptos. That's fine. Right? Does, does it make any sense? Yes? Sort of. So I want to talk about uh, a little bit about some of the competitive landscape so that you guys can familiarize yourself somewhat with different stablecoin projects that are out there. There are many more since I made this slide a few weeks ago. Like new ones being announced every single day. So I've already talked a couple times about this idea of asset backed versus non-asset backed. And here you can see some of the different projects that are in these different categories. I mentioned already that the fiat back means we're going to take in USD or JPY or some kind of fiat, stick it in a vault, and then issue a token against it. That was that casino chip model that I was talking about. And that's a centralized model um, that has some benefits, but it's also got some problems, like it could be subject to seizure and what have you. There's also crypto back. Uh, I think you know, a project that I really admire is um, MakerDAO and their DAI token, right? So a simple way for understanding the way that that is structured is that you've got, you stick your ETH in a smart contract, out the other side you can create DAI, the stable coin, right? And then there are seven incentives that keep it remaining stable, okay? So, um, this is a this is a this is a model, as I said, that I really respect. It's really elegant and beautiful. Uh, but you know, I personally don't want to create any die because it's very hard, first of all. And secondly, there's another thing that can happen. If the price of ETH declines, then that contract can be liquidated and you can use your ETH. So personally, I don't feel there's a lot of incentive for me to go create die. Uh, I don't I don't really have any I don't really have any any incentive to do it whatsoever. It's hard and I can lose my heat. I don't, I don't like those things. So I think that that crypto backed models are um, are very interesting, but I don't know that they have either the simplicity or kind of the economics that can really make them winners over the long run. On the non-asset backed side, you've got senior shares model. Is that term familiar to any of you guys? Have you heard of basis before base coin? That's the best known. Uh, version of this model. Um, when we started to design our token, our stablecoin, uh, we were really lucky that we had not read this one white paper by a guy named Robert Sands. And uh, John and I were at lunch in San Francisco with Joey Krug, who's from Augur and from Pantera now. And he told us about it, but we hadn't read it before we started building. And I say that this was really lucky because that paper was about this model, senior shares. Um, an oversimplified way of explaining this approach to creating stable coins is that uh, it's kind of like you look at the central bank or the Federal Reserve in the United States and you observe all of the complex ways that they control money supply to aim for that 2% annual interest target that they aim for. Senior shares is an attempt to take those approaches to stability and write them into algorithms. I guess the easiest way to think about it is that you is, is the difference between this and what I described that we do is all about how you remove money from the money supply. Everybody adds money to the money supply the same way, right? You print more money. But how do you remove it? That's the big distinction. So this model is like, um, you remove, you remove the money from the money supply by incentivizing someone to do something like buy a bond, 
right? So it's a third party who has a financial incentive. They're gonna take the money out of the money supply for a period of time, and over time they're going to get their principal back and some interest on top of that, okay? So, it's kind of cool so far. However, uh, we think there's a big problem, and that is there's a basic assumption that this model makes, and that is that the market cap for the stable coins will continue to grow forever. It may waver this week or from day to day, but over time it's going to continue to grow. And that's a dangerous assumption. That's a really dangerous assumption. Um, you know, uh, in the Western Hemisphere, where I'm from, there's some Latin American countries who have issued bonds, you know, their governments who can tax their citizens and so forth, but that doesn't prevent some of these bonds from collapsing from time to time, right? So if you're a bondholder and you think that you're not going to get paid back, maybe, or you start to worry about that, all of a sudden you want to sell that bond for whatever you can sell it for. And so that can lead to a crisis of confidence. So we see that as a fundamental flaw in this particular approach. Our approach, again, is also not absolutely perfect, but we think it's the best approach. And it has to do with that burning. Remember, I was talking about how the money gets burned or removed from the money supply via those small transaction fees that goes to a burn wallet. This is superior, we think, because this blockchain has the ability to drastically reduce its money supply if it needs to. It can wind down the whole thing. It can wind it down on its own. For example, with really conservative assumptions of 15% daily turnover and a 2% transaction fee that's going to the burn wallet, this blockchain would delete 8% of the money supply in 30 days and 40% of the money supply in 180 days. So you're talking about the ability to really, really destroy significant portions of the market cap over the medium term. And that's really important because you don't want to count on human actors to remove money from the money supply, we believe. You can do it algorithmically. We need to have an approach that realizes that someday the money supply is going to need to go away, right? It may be that the US dollar loses its reserve currency status. It may be that a much better, you know, biometric focused currency comes along and now nobody cares about this currency. Whatever happens, something's going to happen in the future. And so that that blockchain needs to be able to wind it down so that you don't so that you don't leave a lot of people high and dry. The way that we're really differentiate ourselves is first and foremost through that very unique approach to stability, that mint and burn model. Um, and also our focus on end consumers. And finally um, we have, I think, a, a pretty cool outlook in terms of the way that we partner with others and the way that we make this product useful for the marketplace in general. Uh, and it all goes back to goes back to the to the model. So uh, I mentioned that the miners in our network are the ones who benefit from all the newly minted stablecoin, and our our model. As a, as a company is to be a big miner alongside our other miners. So what we really care about, if we're self-interested, all we really care about is making KUSD really useful to lots and lots of people, uh, to other projects who might want to use this in their ecosystems, uh, to payment platforms, to merchants, and so on. Because all we really want is for that market cap to continue to grow and grow. So we haven't talked that much about use cases. I mentioned before that traders definitely need stable coins, like the most other as a trading pair, you know. Um, but payment platforms need stable coins if we ever want crypto to really go big scale into the regular economy. Um, and then finally, consumers, we can give them a gateway into, into cryptocurrency. Oh, thank you. Um, I guess I should mention this. Our, our, uh, one of the things that we're trying to do to make this very accessible to individuals is create simple, intuitive, and elegant apps that are not language intensive, that allow people to get, secure, send, 
control, spend their money very, very easily. Uh, and starting off with a basic wallet, and you know, those are a dime a dozen, but we have some really cool stuff planned for this and, uh, in the upcoming future. And I'm not preview one of those today, although I think the slide is screwed up. No, it's actually not screwed up. Oh, you can fix it. Thank you. <laughs> um, so this is just a preview uh, for you guys of, uh, of a new addition to our white paper that will be that will be debuting over the coming days. And I just want to give you an idea about the other kinds of products that we can build and integrate in with this protocol that I've just been describing to you. So um, what this is a demonstration of is something that we call a stability contract. A long time ago, you used to be able to have a bank account and you put your money in the bank and they would pay you an interest rate on it. You know, I think that exists some, some places, but not very much anymore. But it'd be kind of cool if you had a way to make money on a stable coin. And that's really what a stability contract is. It's a smart contract that's on the blockchain and it gives you a place to park your money when you don't need to use it. So it's got two addresses inside. One is a KUSD address and another one is a KUSD bonus address. And so as you leave your money in there when you don't need to use it, you are going to be the beneficiary of additional payments in the form of the stable coin that are rolling in to that smart contract. This money is coming from uh, a diversion of part of the burn fee that I was talking about before, that stability fee. So that when money gets burned, some of it goes to the burn wallet, and a portion of it flows to these stability contracts. Another way of saying that is that uh, if you think about the incentives that that creates for users in the marketplace, what is it doing? Well, in those moments when it's below one US dollar on the exchange, like we talked about before, we know a couple of things happen. We know that the block rewards stop, right? And we know that that stability fee, that transaction fee kicks in. And as I explained earlier, in the first version, all of that flowed to a burn wallet. Now some of it will also flow to into these stability contracts as a type of interest payment. It's not really interest, but it's sort of like that. So in those moments, what are we doing? We're incentivizing people to take their stable coin, let's say off of the exchange or even out of their wallets, and park it, park it somewhere where they're not going to use it for a while. What does this do? This remove, effectively removes money from the money supply, which is what we want in those times for sure, right? And it also gives people a way to earn money for contributing in this indirect fashion to the stability of the stable coin. Additionally, for our miners, it's really great because it incentivizes people to remain in the stable coin instead of moving into other assets. Right? So this is just one instance of the many things that we can build and integrate into that wallet for our users. Um, and there's many, many others as well. I'll talk a little bit about those. Uh, so what this protocol, this Koala protocol is, this system that I've described for creating stability, it's, it's, this, it's this robot, right? That's gonna always aim for that number, whatever it is. In this case, it's one US dollar. But something that's important to realize is that once you build the protocol, we can make additional versions that aim for other stuff. Right? We can make it aim at JPY, at the Japanese yen, for example. Okay, so that's, that's the same thing, right? Or we can take a basket of currencies and have it aim for the weighted average of that basket of currencies second by second by second. We can even take the temperature, we can make a temperature coin, temper Tokyo temperature coin. And we can take information from the National Weather Service of Japan and feed it into the blockchain, and this coin would track, right now probably the temperature's going down, so it'd be tracking down now, and in the morning when it starts to heat up again, it would start tracking up, and in the winter it would track down, and the summer it would track up. Now this sounds kind of silly on its surface, but if you start thinking about it a little bit, I mean, it'd be kind of a cool game, right? Um, but you could also utilize this potentially for something like the prediction market if you wanted to. Not for temperature, maybe, but for other things, like prices of uh, commodities or whatnot. Um, finally, we can use this protocol to create something like a crypto mutual fund. We could take the top 10 cryptos 
roll them into a basket, and create a K coin that tracks the value of those top 10 coins. And now all of a sudden you have a simple cryptocurrency that so somebody can buy and trade very, very easily on the exchange. But in doing so, by holding that, they're getting exposure to those, you know, top list of cryptos, for example. You can do the same thing with many, many, many other uh, classes of assets. And so, um, so this is really cool. We're excited about it. We're starting with this, with this particular USD stablecoin for obvious reasons. And, uh, and uh, we're gonna take you know, kind of a short list of, 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 of use cases for stablecoin, but let's just be honest. I mean, the uses for stablecoin are the same as the uses for money, right? Anywhere you need to use money, you can use stablecoin. Um, this sort of brings me back around to the first slide that I showed you with those big numbers, 133 million and 110 million. And this, all of these different use cases, this is why Google and Goldman Sachs and those companies are throwing hundreds of millions of dollars at stablecoin right now. It's because if, when we figure out stablecoin and we get it working and we get it into the hands of users, we get distribution, it's trillion dollar market caps. It's, it, it's, it's trillions and trillions of dollars. And so this is a very, very big prize that we are chasing and many other great projects are chasing too. So uh, we think 2018 is going to be largely the year of the stable point when you start to see some of these things uh, take off in terms not just, of, not just as a trading tool on the exchange, but actually start to gain some traction in the marketplace of consumers. And so I would urge you guys to investigate our project more deeply and also some of these other stable point projects too because there may be some cool opportunities uh, that arise from that. Um, this is just sort of a visual illustration of, of the, you know, how this could work. Um, so if you have uh, different trading pairs on an exchange and a stable coin like KUSD or KJPY, a regular user can decide to pull some cash off of the exchange in the form of the stable coin. Now I've got essentially a mobile wallet where with a currency that's going to hold its value, and I can do what I want to. I can I can shoot it to my friend to help pay for dinner. I can stick it in the stability contract, earn a little bit of earn a little bit of money on it. Uh, I can shoot it <coughs> to my family members in, in the Philippines or something if I'm a, if I'm a foreign worker in Dubai, uh, or ultimately I can go and actually buy a pair of Nike shoes or something like that first. So the stable coin is kind of the, the key to unlocking this, to, to bridging the gap between all of these parties and the entire cryptocurrency industry. Um, you know, I stopped looking at the total market caps of crypto for the last days because it, it, it makes me sad. Um, <laughs> but whatever it is, 300 billion, 400 billion, you know, this is a joke, this is tiny. Very very tiny. We're about to see, we're about to see the emergence of security tokens, where you've got the security, securitization of all kinds of assets and equities, um, of commodities. This is going to blow up, and those numbers for the total market cap of all cryptocurrencies is going to go into the trillion. And so, if we want to bridge that over into the regular world of business and consumer shopping and paying our rent and going to the grocery store and so forth. We need the stable coin. We need a, an easy transition for people to make that connection with the crypto markets. And so that's what, that's what we're up to. Um, yes, please check us out and join our, and join our Telegram group if you would, and you can ask lots of questions.